Hi everybody, I'm Jeremiah Reiner, and thank you again for joining us for a brand new episode of Deeply Rooted. Hello friends and wherever you may be at and however you may be listening, thank you for checking us out here on another episode of Deeply Rooted. As always, I'm your host, Jeremiah Ronner, and thank you so much for being with us today. Again, wherever you're at and however you may be listening to us, whether it be through our YouTube channel or on iTunes, we appreciate the support so much. We want to kick into today's program a little bit differently, but with the title of Deeply Rooted, um, as our podcast is, part of understanding Uh, why we're so passionate about uh, digging in and making sure that we have a great fundamental foundation, not only in scriptures, but also looking at the history of the church, history of Christianity. And I think sometimes we forget uh, some of the pillars that we stand on, some of the great giants of the faith that we're a part of. This year, 2019, we're very fortunate enough uh, to come up on a slight anniversary, so to speak, and that's kind of where we're going to go today with our podcast. In 1779, uh, which is 240 years ago, uh, if you'll look through something called the Oni Hymnal, uh, written by a man by the name of John Newton, who's responsible for well over 230 of those hymns in that book, was actually to his congregation, you'll find a simple hymn in there titled Amazing Grace. Uh, It was published in 1779 through the Oni Hymns there. Written in 1773, however, to his congregation, but we want to celebrate technically the 240th anniversary of that hymn, going into that hymn book, and what it's meant to the people of Christianity, what it's meant uh, to the gospel presentation after all these years. We want to look at the life of John Newton and what it means to us today, looking back at it historically speaking, and what we can glean from it. A partner with William Cowper in writing a collection of hymns uh, to their congregation, over 300 of them, just exactly. You have a man who was a former captain of a slave ship who became a pastor. He was a counselor uh, to a man by the name of William Wilberforce, who was instrumental in probably the greatest abolitionist the world has ever known in fighting the slave trade in Great Britain but prominently known for his hymn, Amazing Grace. And we want to talk a little bit about that today, looking at his life and ultimately what it means to us and looking back on this great hymn and how rich it is in our Christian history. But Newton was born in July 24th, 1725. That was in London. Uh, His mother actually died when he was six. Uh, Newton lived to be the ripe age of 82, passing away in December of 1807. Uh, Amazing Grace, the hymn that he's known for, has been adapted by probably thousands of people worldwide, from country music to gospel and folk singers and pop singers and every genre of music that you and I can imagine, which is what he is widely known for. But looking at his life, especially in the beginning, you would have never thought in a million years that's exactly where that man would have ended up. But Uh, Newton's mother was actually a devout Congregationalist, a Puritan, so to speak. Uh, John was her only son because, as I said earlier, she died at the age of six when John was six years old. Uh, John's father was not exactly a a spiritual man by any means, but uh, his mother actually taught him very well, often reading the Westminster Catechism and would read him a lot of hymns. They would rehearse them together, especially one of his favorites, Isaac Watts, one of the great hymn writers of all time. His father remarried, uh, and his new wife, his second wife, really had no spiritual interest. Uh, Newton was actually, uh, from about the ages of 8 to 10, was only educated for those two years of his early upbringing. Uh, He attended a boarding school in Stratford and so missed out on a tremendous amount of education. As a matter of fact, later in life, you would find he actually never had any formal theological education and still accomplished so much. But by the age of 11, he had begun to set sail with his father, who was the captain of a boat there. 
and sadly, they would be the captains of a slave ship. Uh, by the time he was 17, John met the love of his life. Her name was Mary Catlett. They fell in love. He was obsessed with her. Uh, at the age of 24, they were married, and for the next 40 years, they would stay passionately married, serving the Lord together uh, until her death. Uh, three years after she died, uh, John actually published a huge collection of letters that he had written about her on those three voyages that he took to Africa while they were married as he set sail there. Just really tremendous love for his wife. Looking back, though, he was actually forced into naval service uh, against his will at the age of 18. Uh, very angry, very bitter situation. He was placed on the Harwich. Uh, that's the name of the boat. And he was a midshipman there. Actually wrote of itself, he said, quote here, I was capable of anything, and I had not lost uh, fear of God before my eyes, nor, so far as I remember, the least sensibility of consciousness. My love to Mary was now the only restraint I had left. As a matter of fact, he actually, in one of the home visits they made, deserted the ship and was caught. Uh, history tells us that he was actually confined a couple of days in a guardhouse, and sometimes even in shackles, they actually publicly stripped him and whipped him and then eventually took his office of midshipman. He was 20 uh, when he was actually put off of a ship onto a small island just on the southeastern part of Sierra Leone, which is in West Africa. Uh, for about a year there, he lived as practically a slave in a in very terrible situation, circumstances. The owners or the masters, so to speak, there despised him, treated him very poorly. Uh, he even wrote as uh, in his diaries and journals that even some of the African slaves would try to smuggle in food for him and their own you know, minute rations that they had. Uh, later in his life, though, looking back, he is astonished at a situation that took place. A ship actually put anchor down on his island after seeing some smoke that was arising from it. And it just so happened to be a ship with a captain on it that knew Newton's father. Uh, and he actually managed to get him free from that bondage. Uh, that was in February of 1747, not even hardly 21 years old, and God really beginning to showcase himself in John's life of what he was capable of with that miraculous rescue. March 21st, 1748, on his way home to England in the North Atlantic, God began to perform some very serious pursuit of John in the form of sea wreckage and storms. Uh, he woke up one night to a very terrible storm and his room was actually beginning to fill with water on the ship. So he ran to the deck and the captain stopped him and told him to go and grab a knife. While he did that, the man that actually took his place there of where he was at was, was washed overboard by a great wave. Um, John recalls having written there, praying that the Lord would have mercy upon us. He said that was the first time in a long time he had ever really expressed need for mercy. He began to work the pumps there uh, from three in the morning almost until uh, noon, and then he took a quick hour nap, and then he got back on the helm and actually began to steer the ship all the way until midnight. Uh, he began to pray, but he couldn't utter prayers of faith, he said. Quote, I could not draw near to a reconciled God and call him Father. The comfortless principles of infidelity were deeply riveted. Quote, the great question now was how to obtain faith. Well, he began the pursuit because he grabbed the Bible and spent much time in prayer and study uh, for the rest of that voyage. He combed over the scriptures, and by April 8th, they had actually anchored in Ireland. And then the next storm hits, a very violent storm that should have sank the ship, but in a remarkable miracle, they were able to make it to shore. Uh, he began to notice a substantial change in his life, but even on his own words would say later, looking back, he never felt like there was a full conversion at that point in his life. February 1st, 1750, flash forwarding a little bit. He married Mary, uh, and that June his father actually drowned in a swimming accident in the Hudson Bay. So from the height of joy all the way to the bottom of despair, he's now lost both of his parents, but he's now married to the love of his life. Uh, he actually went on three more voyages after they were married, he and Mary, and sometimes leaving her from anywhere from 10 months to just over a year at a time. 
but ultimately in November of 17 and 54, he had an epileptic seizure and he never sailed again. Now in the years between his high sea voyages and eventually him becoming pastor at Olney, he was a surveyor of tides in Liverpool and he also became a very active member in his local congregation. He loved the evangelicals from both the Anglican side and the independents who were being a part of this new great awakening. And he was especially taken by the famed revivalist and preacher George Whitfield. Uh, he devoted himself during this time to very strenuous study, uh, lots of worship, lots of prayer. He applied himself greatly to studying Greek and Hebrew. He was obsessed with gaining knowledge and understanding of the scriptures. He had a passion and a zeal for God like none other. Uh, again, self-taught in all these things, a, a miracle in and of itself, looking at his educational uh, holdbacks. But in 1764, he eventually accepted the call to the pastorate there of the Church of England Church there in Olney. He served for almost 16 years. And then ultimately at the age of 54, though, he accepted a call to St. Mary's Woolnoff in London, where he began a 27-year ministry that would eventually end December 8, 1779. The last time he ever filled the pulpit uh, was on October of 1806. He was 81 years old. One of his good friends, Richard Cecil, told him that he thought at the age of 80 he probably should retire, and Newton responded with, Shall the old African blasphemer stop while he can speak? Such a great piece of advice for us. No retiring. From God's Word. John and Mary never had any children of their own. They actually adopted two nieces uh, who would eventually come back and take care of them in their elder age as well. Mary died sadly 17 years before John. Uh, he would die eventually on December 21st of 1807. He was 82 years old. Just a month before he died, he expressed just how resolute his faith was. Quote, it is a great thing to die. And when flesh and heart fail to have God for the strength of our heart and our portion forever, I know whom I have believed, and he is able to keep that which I have committed against that great day. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me that day. The hymn that we referred to, Amazing Grace, that he's widely known for, it was actually written to accompany a New Year's sermon, which was based out of 1 Chronicles 17, verse 16. Uh, he and William Cowper, who he had counseled for many, many, many years, often taking him into his home, Cowper struggled mightily with depression over and over, and uh, Newton took it upon himself to be his right-hand man and confidant and spiritual leader. Uh, matter of fact, even preached his funeral upon his passing. But Hymn writing was something very special to Newton. He had written hundreds and hundreds. As a matter of fact, they wrote the only hymnals. Um, Cowper has uh, quite a few in there, but Newton with nearly 230 plus hymns written in there, one of those being uh, the original name of it, Faith's Review and Expectation was the original name of it, but not as widely popular as you might think in England. It didn't become well known until about the Second Great Awakening in the early 1800s, actually in the United States. Um, many slaves love this hymn, in particular for the meaning of it and, and the history behind it. It used to get sung at revivals uh, to a lot of different tunes, actually, uh, but eventually being settled on, I believe it was 1847, it was first published with the lyrics to the melody New Britain, which is the one it's recognized under today. So the song that we sing, Amazing Grace, that you and I would understand, is written to that melody. Um, in 1852, though, probably the most famous thing, I guess, that could have happened to it, Harriet Beecher Stowe uh, wrote her famed book, Uncle Tom's Cabin, and actually mentions the song in the text there. And she even included uh, a few verses that weren't in Newton's original version. Uh, the original text uh, had different verses in it, and one of the ones added to it during that time became ultra famous. Uh, it says that when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Harriet Beecher Stowe was actually a daughter 
and a sister of revival preachers, and it's widely believed that she would have heard that verse of the song and the version of that song sung that way in revival meetings, which is often pretty common. Revival leaders used to switch out lyrics and melodies from hymns time to time, mixing and matching so that the congregations would know exactly what to sing and were very familiar with it. The first official recording that we know of Amazing Grace, however, would not come until 1922. That was by the original Sacred Heart Choir. Um, a remarkable history here of this man, um, of what this means to the Christian faith. Uh, I want to read you what he said here from his last will and testament. We read from Newton's. He said, I commit my soul to my most gracious God and Savior, who mercifully spared and preserved me when I was an apostate, a blasphemer, and an infidel, and delivered me from the state of misery on the coast of Africa, into which my obstinate wickedness had plunged me, and who has been pleased to admit me, though most unworthy, to preach his glorious gospel. Reminds me of later in his life, Newton, uh, looking back on things, it was said that someone in a service once recited 1 Corinthians 15.10, By the grace of God, I am what I am. He remained silent for a little bit and then began to speak up. Newton said, I'm not what I ought to be, and ah, oh, how imperfect and deficient. I'm not what I might be, considering my privileges and opportunities. I'm not what I wish to be. God knows my heart and knows I wish to be like Him. I'm not what I hope to be. Before long, I'll drop this clay tabernacle to be like him and see him as he is. Yet I am not what I once was, a child of sin and a slave of the devil. Though not all these, not what I ought to be, not what I might be, not what I wish or hope to be, and not what I once was, I think I can truly say with the apostle, by the grace of God, I am what I am. At the age of 82, right before his death, Newton is famously quoted as saying, My memory is nearly gone, but I remember two things, that I am a great sinner and that Christ is a great Savior. If you find Newton's headstone one day, it will read this on the epitaph. John Newton, once an infidel and a libertine, a servant of slaves in Africa, was by the rich mercy of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, preserved, restored, pardoned, and appointed to preach the faith he had long labored to destroy. So absolutely we can resonate with Mr. Newton and saying, by the grace of God, we are what we are, and it is absolutely amazing. I wanted to share that story with you, and I wanted to bring that to light because of the significance of that song being sung hundreds and hundreds of years now in the Christian faith, what it's meant to so many people, its rich heritage, but most importantly, how rich it is in theology and Christian doctrine and just how biblical it is in light of the man's life and what he did with the slave trade and then ultimately, by the grace of God, having his life turned around by Jesus Christ to preach the good news to people, leading countless people to the Lord, inspiring Christians for higher service, writing all those great hymns that he was responsible for, leading people in worship, and then pointing people to the reality that slavery was an absolute evil and providing himself uh, as an abolitionist, a, a fundamental hater of that type of evil and dedicating his life to service for Jesus Christ. And looking back on that, what a, what a great story, what a great piece of Christian history and we say all that to give glory to our Father in heaven who is responsible for the salvation of Mr. Newton, for the inspiration of those words, for the rich heritage that it means to us. Um, we're fortunate enough here at Deeply Rooted, one of my good friends, uh, Cody Mabe, who has went above and beyond in being our sound technician and our recording studio guru. Uh, he's the reason that this sounds 110 times better than it probably should. He's the one responsible for the introductory song uh, and piecing all these things together. I can't say enough about him, uh, but also very fortunate to know him as a good friend with tremendous talent that God's blessed him with. Um, I've asked him to close us out uh, very fittingly by singing Amazing Grace. 
Uh, so I'm going to stay silent now and turn it over to him. And as soon as he's done, we'll come right back with some closing announcements. So until next time, God bless you guys. Hope you have a great week. And let's never forget and let's never be um, lulled to sleep by the reality that this song, it means so much to us. So as he sings it, reflect on the great grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Good.